Welcome back to the Chem OG. Today we're going to talk about electron shielding and how it affects effective nuclear charge. And so what is shielding? Well, when you take a look at electrons that exist inside an atom, they experience two distinct forces. One of them is an attractive force and one of them is a repulsive force. Now the attractive force is due to the protons that exist on the nucleus. The protons have a positive charge that is attractive to those electrons and they experience repulsion from other electrons. So let's take a look at that dichotomy, the attraction and the repulsion separately. And so when you take a look at the attraction, electrons love positive charge. And the only source of positive charge inside the atom is from the nucleus. And so electrons that are closer to the nucleus are closer to that attractive force and they're gonna feel a stronger attraction. So the distance between the electron and the nucleus is gonna play an important factor here. And it's also true that the more protons there are, the stronger the attraction will be. So an electron is gonna be more attracted to a nucleus that contains three protons as compared to a nucleus that only contains two protons. Okay, so all else being equal, when you have more protons on the nucleus, that provides a stronger attraction. And it also explains why it is that a cation in general is more attractive than a neutral atom. So if you're taking a look at uh, the electrons that exist around a cation, they're more attracted to that cation than they would be if the same atom were neutral. So positive charge all the way. If we take a look at the things that offer a repulsion, well, it's going to be pretty much the opposite of the stuff that we just talked about. So electrons repel one another. The more it is that we start putting in more and more electrons inside an atom, the more repulsion that we're going to introduce. And so any electrons that come between the nucleus and a specific electron are going to contribute to repulsion. If we have electrons that do not come between the nucleus and a specific electron, they don't contribute to the repulsion. So there's a reason for the double negative here. And I, and I want you to think about the example of, let's say that you're sitting in a, uh, you know, and you're attending a concert or a sporting event. If somebody is in front of you, or if someone sitting or a fan who's in a row in front of you is, you know, doing something obnoxious or something that is a little bit rude, it's going to detract from your ability to be able to enjoy the event, right? So let's say that, you know, you're rooting for a particular team or, you know, your favorite performers on stage. If somebody is uh, maybe a little bit under the weather or if somebody is you know had a, a little bit too much in terms of recreational stuff and that person is acting like a fool well that's going to detract from your ability to be able to enjoy the event but if that same person who's acting obnoxiously is behind you or in one of the seats behind you you're not going to be repulsed by that person because you don't even know that they're there if that person who is acting obnoxiously is in the same row that you are, but off to the right or off to the left, again, that person is not detracting from your ability to enjoy the event. So anytime you have electrons that don't come between the nucleus and the electron, they're not going to contribute to repulsion, okay? Because they're not affecting the ability of that particular electron to enjoy all the awesome attractive ability of the nucleus. So electrons in lower energy levels then are going to be repulsive, right? So if you're looking at a particular electron and you have electrons that are in lower energy levels, or in other words, closer to the nucleus, they're going to act as a repulsive force. And that's because they shield you from experiencing the full attractive effect, as we mentioned. If we have an anion, that's more repulsive than a neutral atom. Because if you have a negative charge overall, that's not going to be a very welcoming environment for electrons in general. And so the electrons don't feel nearly as attracted to the atom if they have to, you know, be there with a full blown negative charge. So those are conceptually different factors that are going to affect how attracted or how unattracted an electron may be, you know, to uh, an atom. And so there are three factors then that contribute to that amount of attraction experienced by an electron. And that amount of attraction that's experienced by electron for sort of uh, taking a look at all these effects combined is something we call the effective nuclear charge. And so the effective nuclear charge is actually a uh, number that we can calculate um, somewhat experimentally. And um, you know, the exact way in which we do it is 
probably beyond the scope of this discussion. But when we take a look at the effective nuclear charge, we can theoretically uh, calculate an effective nuclear charge for each one of the electrons that happen to be sitting in our atom based on the experience that it has. And so that's going to be a combined rubric from the net charge, right? Whether we have a neutral atom or a cation or an anion, it's also going to take into account how far that particular electron is from the nucleus, right? So that matters as well. And it's also going to be based on the proton's effect after the repulsion. Okay, so if there are electrons that are in front of us, they're going to affect overall how much uh, the effective nuclear charge is. And so what is that proton's effect after repulsion? Well, to simplify sort of the quote unquote calculation here, we can just think of it as the number of protons that are on that nucleus minus the inner core electrons. Or if we're looking at it from a periodic table standpoint, it's the atomic number, because remember that's the number of protons, minus the electrons contributed by the previous noble gas. And so if we take a look at a couple of examples here, if I take a look at fluorine, fluorine has nine protons. The noble gas that comes before it is helium. And so essentially the protons effect here after the repulsion is accounted for is that the protein has a pretty good attractive effect on its electrons. It's got essentially a seven, right? And the reason that that number is uh, very positively away from zero is simply because there are lots of protons that fluorine has relative to how many inner core electrons there are. So there are nine electrons total, but only two of them are inner core. And that means that even the seven electrons in the valence shell, they don't have that much repelling them from feeling the attractive effect of the protons. And that definitely contributes to why it is that fluorine is so darn electronegative. If we continue down the list of halogens and take a look at chlorine, chlorine has 17 protons, yes, but it also has more inner core electrons. And so if we take a look at the attractive effect of the chlorine nucleus, it's gonna be with respect to the protons effect after the repulsion, very much the same, right? Now, chlorine's effect on its outer electrons is not quite the same as fluorine's because of the distance factor that we talked about a little bit earlier. But in terms of just taking a look at protons and inner core electrons, right? Both fluorine and chlorine are going to attract electrons pretty darn well. And again, that's the reason that they're both electronegative. So if we're summarizing this information here, we're going to notice that the effect of nuclear charge is dependent on three things. Okay, So uh, the effect of nuclear charge is going to be proportional to the overall charge on our species. So if we have a cation, that cation is going to be able to attract electrons more effectively than an anion would. So the effect of nuclear charge is proportional to the overall amount of charge. So the more positive this number gets, the more it is that the effect of nuclear charge is increasing, the more negative this gets. Well, if we have a negative number here, that kind of takes away from the effectiveness, if you will, of the protons uh, and their ability to be able to attract the outer electrons. Uh, another factor we can take a look at is distance. So if we have a larger distance from the nucleus, that greatly diminishes the effect of nuclear charge. So even if there's a, a whole bunch of protons on that particular nucleus, as you drift further and further away and as you go to higher and higher energy levels and uh, increase the distance between that particular electron and the nucleus, what that does is it diminishes the overall effect of charge. And the other factor that we considered was how many protons do we have and what is the shielding effect of those inner core electrons? And so the more it is that we have protons relative to inner core electrons, the higher sort of the adjusted number here is, and we talked about that with the examples of chlorine and fluorine. Um, and so that higher number is going to include an, a more effective nuclear charge. Now there's a whole bunch of things that we didn't necessarily get into, um, which is how do you exactly calculate this, right? So this is a, a proportionality here, but what is the actual equation? And we don't, we didn't also get into effects of you know, the larger orbitals and how they might not be able to shield the electrons, uh, the outer electrons nearly as well, and how that increases attraction. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of concepts that we didn't necessarily get into in this lesson, um, but that wasn't the point, right? The, the point was to have an overall conceptual understanding of effective nuclear charge and what are the, conceptually again, what are the factors that contribute to it? Thank you so much for listening to today's lesson. Please, please, please make sure to hit the like button. And if you haven't done so yet, please support this channel by subscribing.
See you at the next lesson.